Okay. So now we are live on to YouTube. Yeah. I'll just and, start. Uh, yeah, Shilpa, madam, start. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. So with the overwhelming response that we have received, which is close to almost 44,000 views on uh, the YouTube for all the previous masterclasses, I welcome you to this 10th masterclass by Dr. J. Mehta. Uh, so this uh, topic is uh, uh, stimulation in PCOS uh, patients in non-IVF uh, cycles. Uh, PCOS, as we all know, is something which is quite complicated, uh, in, especially in stimulation. So I expect Dr. Jay to make it uh, more simplistic and uh, more easy, like something like mathematics, where everybody can replicate this into their clinical practice. So over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you. And uh, it's just amazing, no? Uh, night 10 o'clock and we have 360 people for this session. So I think uh, we have told this many, many times and we are repeating one time before we start this session again. This is an initiative of Shilpa Madam. And if anybody wants to request for any topics, uh, contact her directly. If there are any constructive comments or criticisms, please contact her directly so that we guys can improve and teach you in a better manner. Okay. So I will start off with the whiteboard and, uh, and uh, Shilpa Madam, just verify if my whiteboard is visible. Yes, yes, it is. Okay. So first thing before we start understanding how to stimulate polycystic ovarian syndrome patients in non-IVF cycles. So when we are talking of non-IVF cycles or when we are talking of IVF cycles, one thing is going to be common and that is the mechanism of action. So, you know, if I draw the ovary, this is all that you need to understand to understand any form of stimulation. Normally, a patient of polycystic ovarian syndrome is characterized by something called as insulin resistance. Okay. Now, because of this insulin resistance, because there is an insulin resistance, as a result of which there is something called as compensatory hyperinsulinemia. It's very, very simple, right? Same thing happens in diabetes as well. Okay. Now, unfortunately, whenever there is this compensatory hyperinsulinemia, this thing has a significant effect onto the ovary. What it predominantly does is when we look at the ovary and when we try to look at the cortex or when we try to look at these small, 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 small follicles, okay, inside the ovary, this alters this entire pathway. Okay, the entire pathway gets altered and what typically happens is it produces, if you look at the receptors, no, normally if you are looking at any receptors, okay, this is just one minute of microbiological studies inside this. Whenever the insulin is normal, okay, whenever there is no resistance, okay, the, it, the body normally activates something called as a tyrosine pathway. Okay, through the receptors. And this produces all the normal hormones. Just keep in mind that. Much. Okay, now whenever there is excessive insulin, this excessive insulin actually stimulates something called as a serine pathway, which is again a very molecular level stuff, but I really like it because it is important to understand this molecule when you want to manufacture these drugs. So when you look at serine pathway, it produces more and more and more of androgens. Okay. And this is your key thing. There is an micro excess. So your micro environment in PCOS is androgenic in the ovary. Now, along with this, because of insulin resistance, there is a simultaneous massive Altered LH excess. Okay, this all three words are important. Altered LH excess also contributes to this entire thing. Okay, it also contributes to an androgenic microenvironment. As a result of which, what typically happens is this recruited cohort of follicles which we see, these guys unfortunately end up only as recruited because recruitment is happening daily and apoptotic simultaneously. Okay, As a result of which, you have excessive follicles which are visible on all your ultrasounds or whatever you think of. And whenever you have something like this, okay, 
it is very very simple because of this you have two most important things one is chronic and ovulation which is why we call it as chronic and ovulation causing pcos clinical factor excessive androgen causing pcos this is one and second is that in this situation you have infertility today we are going to concentrate only on the infertility which is developing because of this mechanism of action and remember when you look at this ovary in polycystic ovarian syndrome this is the only mechanism of action that you should be aware of don't study anything else this is everything cut short for you in 5 minutes which you need to know in microbiological level as well as what actually happens okay all the three things there is altered lh excess there is a androgenic micro environment there is a batch of recruited as well as apoptotic follicles which causes chronic and ovulation and there is infertility okay now with this done let us just switch okay and let us just uh, now go on to the actual topic that is how are you going to cause a pcos non ivf stimulation okay so i have divided this entire session which people can actually by heart and this session is divided into four things okay category 1 thin pcos you want to do just natural intercourse thin pcos okay you want to do iui so because we are covering both obese pcos you just want to do natural intercourse obese pcos you want to do iui just remember this so it is very very simple what are we targeting here so if we just draw the targets here see this is our target target here is 1 to 2 follicles iui target is approximately 3 follicles okay very very simple in 5 minutes you will buy hard this again natural intercourse obese and again 3 follicles okay these are our targets everybody agree shilpa madam you agree to these targets yes, okay yes okay drug of choice so this is a chart which i have actually in my hospital which i have designed for my nurses and i'm sharing you the same chart okay so what is the drug of choice in pcos okay please remember no nonsense no overthinking no acting over smart any category your drug of choice is letrozole any category do not make the mistake of coming to anyone and saying that i used clomiphene citrate because there was thin endometrium so now i am you know now should i use letrozole come on guys clomiphene citrate is no longer the drug of choice the drug of choice is letrozole in all the class of patients as far as it is natural intercourse or iui okay point number 3 important for all to understand protocol see if it is a thin patient you are targeting just one to two follicles okay it is very very important that you just use letrozole 2.5 mg okay i'll just draw this 2.5 mg for 5 days that should be more than thin patient you want to do iui okay important thing ah huh? remember 2.5 mg twice in a day should be good okay along with that along with that i will mark it in green you may add hm i will give a logic to this thing so let me spend some time on this and then i'll give you a good logic okay obes 2.5 twice a day 5 days 2.5 again twice a day for five days. so now you understood the basic stimulation and again here also may add hmg this may add hmg is very very important because please remember we all have understood that the recruitment best happens in the first five days and if you want a good recruit recruitment of up to three follicles addition of hmg is a very useful thing 
commonest question in PCOS. What is the standard dose for IUI cycles and natural intercourse cycles also if I want to add it? So the answer is 150 international units of HMG. And that is something which is standard. So I will just write it down. 150 international units of HMG. Now some people are very, very this thing. They like to add RFSH. No problem. Add recombinant FSH. Nothing will be a problem. Because even if you add recombinant FSH in most of the category of patients, there is a good amount of endogenous LH. Okay, there is a good amount of endogenous LH and this endogenous LH, the only problem is this endogenous LH is abnormal. As a result of which, a standard HMG will do very well in order to suppress this endogenous LH and allow follicular growth. People who think that no, 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 endogenous LH is present, so I will use only recombinant FSH can do that, but remember there you are relying on an abnormal LH, okay? So just keep that in mind, but I leave that to your fine sense of wisdom, okay? What to do when this protocol has failed? So this standard protocol failures, that means somebody has already attempted at least three to four cycles of this and failed. Somebody has attempted three to four cycles of this and failed. Somebody has attempted three to four cycles here and failed. Somebody has attempted three to four cycles here and failed. Patient has changed the doctor. Patient has come to you. And now the patient is asking, what to do, doctor? Can you suggest me something different? All right. So whenever you want to suggest something different, one good thing which you can try to add for your patients okay, in this situation can be Extended letrozole. What is extended letrozole protocol? Blanket 2.5 twice in a day for 8 to 10 days. Again, again, in this situation, as I said, one may add HMG whenever necessary. And I've also seen people adding low dose HCG. So may add low dose HCG when they find necessary, but it is absolutely not. Indeed. Okay. We have discussed extended letrozole protocol many, many times. Let us not be discussing doubts and questions just on extended letrozole all the time. Okay. Because we have discussed it many, many times. Okay. And just in case somebody wants, we'll have a full fledged lecture on just extended letrozole for people. Okay. Any role of adjuvants in any of this, which as a doctor, you should remember. Okay. See, remember, thin PCOS patient, okay, metformin can be beneficial. There is no doubt in that fact. Thin PCOS, you want to do metformin can be beneficial. There is absolutely no doubt in that fact. Okay. Along with metformin, you may also have some benefit of low dose steroids. Okay. Obese PCOS patients, definitely metformin is beneficial. There is no doubt. Obese PCOS, where you want to do IUI, definitely metformin is beneficial and you may add low dose steroids. Now, surprisingly, I have not added your wonder marketed drugs, B chiro inositol and myo inositol. So, let me please justify this. No established role of B chiro or myo inositol in increasing insulin sensitivity. No established one. Please take this as a take home point. Okay. But please remember, if you want to give steroid, the steroid of choice which we give to the patient is simple Visolone 5 mg OD. Okay. 5 mg best given at night. Okay. In any cases, especially when you have a standard protocol failure, in these cases, you may consider to add Visolone. Okay. Otherwise, in a routine protocol, we don't recommend. So it is not recommended in this protocol, but in protocol failures, you can use it. Okay. What should be the trigger? Answer is simple. We have gone through our session on trigger. No matter what you do, the trigger has to be 10,000 HCG. No using your head. The trigger has to be 10,000 HCG. There is no questions, no discrepancy, and no doubts to be entertained on this. In IUI natural cycles, that is the team. And finally, what is going to be your luteal phase support? 
so we discussed it that time as well people think that when they give letrozole this letrozole does not require luteal phase support but please remember in pcos you are trying to deal with an abnormal lh and whenever you are dealing with abnormal lh your standard luteal phase support to the patient after this trigger all the time should be a progesterone gel of 8% okay progesterone gel of 8% you can give it either once in a day or you can give it twice in a day it is completely up to you okay now please remember whenever you are adding metformin whenever you are adding steroids all these things are to be given for the entire cycle okay letrozole is 5 days but metformin is continuous bisolone is continuous you don't have to stop that addition of hmg is typically for the first 5 days addition of hmg is typically for the first 5 days if you need anything additional inside this you can give additional for 3 to 4 days based on your requirements you can add a half dose antagonist in these cases based on your requirements understanding so with this simple i think very very straight forward flow chart on understanding of pcos okay i hope the basic understanding of this topic in a chart manner okay if you click photos of that chart and just print it out there is not going to be a single pcos patient whom you will not be able to stimulate for natural cycles or for iui cycles okay i'm very happy we have around 500 people uh, in the session and uh, i conclude the session as i told you i'll finish it in just 10 minutes because that's all all the time that it's going to require and i hope i have given a good flow chart for people to understand and uh, have some take home points yeah that was excellent what you said i think it is extremely simplified uh, for the most complicated uh, form of disease like pco uh, so we'll just take the uh, chat box questions first Uh, gonadotropin yeah. in our follicular phase will increase recruitment. Uh, will it cause more OSS? I think we have answered this. 150 international units will not cause OSS, so please don't get worried in all that. So, antag uh, in these cycles, do you use? Not needed, yeah. You can use a pre-treatment antag if you want. Okay, and metformin dose? What do you give? 500 twice in a day. Okay, and uh, Vicelone, uh, you told throughout the cycle you give. So even I am G throughout the cycle. So even in the actually, group. actually try and understand. Vicelone is given to reduce the chronic inflammatory state in PCOS. It is not going to add to any sensitization. Okay, so this chronic inflammatory state may help in endometrial sensitivity and increase implantation as well. So it is better to give uh, till the end of the cycle. Okay. Do you give pre-treatment osipils? Oh no no no, not at all. And uh, yeah, low dose. Uh, what along with metformin? So low dose you mentioned HMG right? Or low dose HCG you said? Low dose HCG I mentioned. Yeah. Uh, so HMG for five days along with uh, five days of letrozole is what you practice usually. in your uh, you can setup. make it you can make it 5 days or 7 days based on your requirement all right yeah so where, do you use cc at all in cases of pco no okay do you use estrogen in case if the lining is not good in case no. of pco no okay um so tell me this i mean have you had any experience with uh, Uh, low dose uh, recom BFSH starting from day three. I don't use recombinant FSH, and I'm not a big fan of giving anybody seventy five international units of anything. See, please try and understand. For you to recruit more than two follicles, okay, you need to cross the threshold of recruitment. It is so simple, okay. If it's seventy five international units, you might end up, you know, recruiting two or three follicles. some of them might not some of them might be apoptotic which have got recruited why do you use that just use 150 international units it is standard it gives you excellent stimulation okay 
and don't complicate case to case as i said if you are doing so many cycles you need to standardize it okay this is the dose this is the protocol no headaches to anybody mm -hmm. so how long do you usually continue this uh, letrozole of course it is extended letrozole it becomes 10 days is the extended letrozole okay so 10 days max you continue letros and then if there is no follicle even with this so what do you do oh so that i mean next cycle you should be switching to pure hmg cycles okay and 150 international units for 7 days if that also doesn't help you stimulate that means it is a very resistant ovary and this ovary is going to require dosages in excess of 300 or 375 international units and it will give you very poor quality oocytes okay so do you advise uh, these kind of resistant cases to be handled in a place where there is no facility for ivf in case if there is lot of recruitment and uh, in case if we need to convert the cycle into ivf so what is your take on no. that see medical legally you are going to be in trouble if you do that so better it is to do it in association with your ivf friend okay and where are the situations that you advise uh, lap ovarian drilling in a case of pco have you uh, routinely advised any patients of yours see Or honestly you... we would be doing less than 5 ovarian drillings in a year <laughs> okay and uh, that is going to be predominantly in cases where there is going to be you know very resistant to stimulation patients for example you have tried two or three cycles the cycles have not you know given a single follicle usually what happens is these patients have a very thick cortex due to elevated levels of androgens okay these people have very and they have a thin endometrium also simultaneously okay that is due to androgen excess in these patients your uh, doing drilling is going to help and not in all cases okay it will help in some cases it will not help in the other cases okay so you may try it but i don't routinely recommend it the only indication in my mind for doing a drilling is especially when there is a very thick cortex and patient has been a resistant person to stimulation over two or three attempts then maybe you can counsel for drilling or for ivf okay so you run a very successful ivf program and so you have lot of like you know i mean backup plans in case if uh, things don't go as planned so for uh, people who are do, practicing in uh, like you know remote areas where there is not much access to uh, ivf centers so what precautions yeah. to, to prevent complications like uh, ohss and uh, multiple pregnancies see the best is your stimulation the best prevention is a good stimulation okay so if your stimulation dosages are correct as i said your target follicles are 1 to 2 or 3 okay so when you don't want to exceed that number of follicles you will stimulate them in that manner and two three follicles causing ohss is very rare so i guess everybody should learn very good stimulation and if you stimulate the ovary nicely you are reducing the chances of ohss any which is definitely no agonist trigger in an iui cycle okay okay and uh, what is the role of amh when do you think that you know the amh becomes important in uh, alerting the clinician as to when they should not touch the case any amh more than 10 ideally is a bad amh just remember that okay that is because that is going to give you a either a hyper response or very poor quality oocytes one of the two okay have you used uh, cc along with letrozole in any of your patients i mean there are couple of studies no. No? okay they are good uh, they are good only for studies okay so do you do lh levels uh, on the day 2 and then decide whether uh, they no. the uh, ocpil for uh, uh, no. Uh, no no see i'll tell you why should you not do lh levels on that day because there is an abnormal lh pulse any which ways in pcos that is one of the reasons why fsh to lh ratio has been abandoned okay once upon a time fsh to lh ratio was considered to be very very important in diagnosis of pcos but if the patient is obese her lh pulse secretion is different because of the peripheral estrogen which she secretes okay as compared to a thin patient whose lh pulse secretion is different in pcos as a result of this when you do lh monitoring in a pcos patient you are ending up in trouble because you don't know if it has been secreted i mean if it is a pulse which has been picked up 
or if it is just a crack a trough which has been picked up you will end up doing the wrong cycles and wrong treatment so don't go by lh values in pcos when you want ovarian stimulation please okay and uh, uh, do you consider the ovarian volume in any uh, parameter to decide no. the dose addition of hmt uh, i don't and when do you abandon the cycle say your target is three follicles so what are the situations yeah. yeah where in you convert to ivf if after it? so the first place where you will abandon a cycle is after 7 days of hmg starting from day 2 7 days so day 2 to day 9 okay if there is no follicular response that means the patient is resistant predominantly okay provided your hmg is of good quality okay second if there is a hyper response like let's say same 7 days or same 5 days which you gave and you have recruited 25 follicles okay it's a completely different thing at that point in time but apart from this what is going to happen is when you are using letrozole or when you are using extended letrozole you will have that one to two follicles which have become dominant follicles okay and once you have got those things as dominant follicles you don't have to worry your cycle is going to be successful if not with routine protocol then definitely with extended protocol okay have you used this uh, step up letrozole like starting from 2.5 it is G? very very good it is very very good if you want to use step up letrozole in iui cycles predominantly so what you are supposed to do is two days of 2.5 2 days of 5 and one day of 7.5 or you can have two days of 7.5 also that is when it allows you to have multi follicular recruitment approximately two to three follicles will be recruited the only problem is if you if you go more than that predominantly you can end up with a thin endometrium so use it use it very importantly in those patients where you are not going to give it for more than 6 days okay and uh, in uh, obs pco with uh, bmi more than 25 is there any special uh, protocol you use or no 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 i already mentioned on the chart yeah the same thing right uh, and uh, uh, Yeah, what is your criteria to convert into IVF? I mean, do you counsel them when you start the stimulation for no. IUI? No. Or the total number of conversions which we have had in last year from going from IUI or natural cycles to IVF is one one patient really? in the last one year. Yeah, one patient. Vishmay will give you the data. It is actually he has removed the data just today for me. One patient. Okay. So I I don't think no. I am. you have to stimulate nicely that's very very important okay and uh, 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 with regard to any kind of uh, unexpected uh, problems that you have come across especially in pcu who you have stimulated anything you would want to uh, highlight see one must one must remember that there are going to be a lot of pcos patients who have this chronically thin endometrium these are going to be patients who are this thin pcos patients that is because they have an androgen elevated androgen level okay so just just keep that in mind that is something which is very very important all right how second yeah how do you so the best yeah so sorry. the best way to tackle it is to give hmg stimulation blade plain hmg stimulation to these patients the reason why i am saying is hmg will immediately nullify the pulse and hmg will cause a very good estrogenic micro environment that is because you are recruiting a lot more number of follicles who are going to secrete a lot more estrogen okay and that will help you nullify uh, this thin endometrium problem in these patients okay and uh, along with the step up uh, letrozole do you add hmg also if required yes definitely as i mentioned on the chart whenever you want to add hmg you can either add it from day 2 for 5 days along with letrozole or you have given letrozole for 5 days patient has come to you on the 6th day you want to add it for 3 days more you can definitely do that definitely you can add hmg there is no question there is no doubt so what is the highest dose of hmg you use in uh, iui cycle try not to exceed 150 internationally try not to exceed that okay uh... yeah i think uh... yeah so somebody has asked on day 12 follicle size is 20 but the endometrium is trilamella so that doctor has to go through our uh, lecture on half dose antagonist yeah yeah 
So I think we have finished 30 minutes of our session. So uh, I think this was extremely, extremely good. I think this is one of the best session uh, as basics in non-IVF stimulation. So thank you very much. And I thank each one who joined on a day of festival at 10 o'clock in the night. Uh, I'm really grateful for all your uh, messages and uh, wishes.